Okay, and you are live. Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, April 8th, 2020 Public Services Committee meeting. Uh, Judy, would you call roll? Yes, Ms. Fox. Oops, Ms. Mr. Rosa? Here. Mr. Reiner? Here. Thank you. All right, I guess we have, um, we'll start with our um, staff update, but I'm not sure if Jenny's here. Nick, did you say that we'll put that one to the end or we're, we have a so, so I believe Jay Anderson will be providing the public service update. And so I believe he is prepared to, to do that at this time. All right, it's all yours, Jay. All right, thank you, Jane. Uh, I'm in the same boat as you with technology, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> okay, let me know if you all can see my screen here. Looks good, Jay. Yep. yep. Very good. Thank you. Well, I will get this going. I know we've got a full afternoon uh, with our 2035 framework, our framework uh, being in the first class. So I, we had some great discussion on, on Tuesday afternoon. So I will get rolling through this and we can get down to work here. So good afternoon, council committee members, and thank you for joining us today for the public service divisional update. As you're aware, the Division of Public Service is a newly formed division um, as a result of our reorg. Uh, we're comprised now of street maintenance, solid waste, parks maintenance, horticulture, and forestry. And it, as you all know, um, the overall thought and theory behind this was to realign um, combined services under one operations umbrella and one coordination of services. Um, this afternoon, I'll be giving you a brief update on our operations, along with some metrics that we use to evaluate our services. And given the timing of, the, uh, of this update, I'll also uh, highlight our winter operations, as I'm hoping that we are done with those uh, for <laughs> this year. So, fingers crossed on that one. So, I know you, many of you have seen these uh, several times over, but as a refresher, um, we have several performance metrics that we look at and evaluate throughout the year. Um, the next two slides are examples of dashboards that we routine, routinely monitor. Um, this slide highlights our solid waste and chipping program. Um, as you can see last year, we had a very, very busy year with our chipping program at uh, around 5,600 requests. Um, much of this we attribute to the impact possibly of COVID um, as you know, a lot of folks working from home, a lot of kids at home. Um, so I think people had uh, ample time to get out in the yard, especially in the springtime and early summer months. And they were able to get some yard work done, which really put a challenge on our chipping crews, but uh, they were able to pull through and uh, able to meet the, meet the residential needs. So it is going to be interesting to see how we kind of compare this year with last year but we'll certainly keep an eye on that and uh, we'll, we'll update those metrics and report back to you all as to how things end up uh, for this year. Um, the second dashboard shows our categorical breakdown of overall service requests received last year in 2020. Um, as you can see, we received nearly 2,000 requests this past year. And the bar just to your left is, is just an example and that shows our, our top 10 requests. Now, Keep in mind, that's not nearly all the requests we received, but that's our, that's our highest top 10 requests that we received uh, throughout the year of 2020. So I'm a parks guy, so this one hurts me to show you, but uh, <laughs> I'll be up for it and honest. So this slide shows our average days to complete a service request. And as you can clearly see, the parks category is quite higher, both in solid waste and street maintenance. Um, I do want to let you know there are a variety of factors that affect the days to complete, um, especially those that are routed through the Parks Department. Um, various, various of these requests may be code enforcement related, um, nature, nature education related, and just by the nature of these uh, requests, they can require numerous follow-ups or can be quite complex in the nature, so they do take much longer time to, 
to finally close the request. Um, so it's not always in the most efficient or timely manner, but um, we do we do never want to close a request before we've we make sure we've satisfied the resident's need. Um, we have made improvements on this, so we do know that code enforcement is coming online with the use of this, as well as nature education. So I do expect this number um, for the Parks Department to trend down to, to a much more manageable number here in the future. So getting into street maintenance and performance measures. Just a quick update to our contractual uh, street sweeping. Uh, we're currently in our first sweep of the year. Uh, contractually, we've performed five full sweeps of the year um, throughout the city, and we also supplement our contractual sweeping as needed with our own uh, city sweeper. And we mainly use that sweeper um, for accidents, event prep, special requests. And there's areas that we know um, always have some, some debris issues that we continually run a running program to where we're hitting those areas on a frequent basis. Um, as you can see in 2020, we collected 150 or 175 tons of material. Um, so that program continued to go as well. We are in our last year of the contract with contractual sweepers. So we'll be going out to bid next year as well with this. Okay, our favorite subject, snow and ice. Um, so this year, uh, thankfully, we have only had 12 events, but you know we haven't had really a winter in some time. So this gives you a cost breakdown, and now this is for our streets uh, de department. Um, this gives you a cost breakdown of what our expenditure is worth for this year. Um, so our total total cost for the streets department was 810,000, eight almost 811,000. Um, I wanted to highlight and touch on our, our goals of clearing snow. Um, as you see below there in the green, we had several snow events, and, and this being really my first uh, first year as director over the streets division, um, it was quite a learning experience. But we had several snows um, this year where, where our crews had completed primaries and then got to the secondaries and courts. And then we, we had another snow squall, or we would have another system move through and it push our crews back out to the primaries. Um, once that happened, that kind of resets our clock and starts us all over again. Um, it is a little quicker once we get back in the secondaries and courts, but it does really reset us. So we had several snow events uh, last year that really impacted us um, with regards to that. So. I wanted to make sure I brought that um, brought that up and mentioned that. Um, so this was quite a challenging year um, as far as snow events go, at least given the past few years. And this slide gives us a breakdown of expenditures um, going past or going back the past five years. So you can see where we landed this year it is somewhat in the middle, um, which would put us on average um, 17 and 18. Really had a had a banner year there. But um, that kind of gives you an idea of where we settled in over the past five years. So moving on to solid waste. Solid waste chipper service, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this past year we saw a fairly substantial increase in the number of requests received previous years. And you can see on the bar graph there to the right, um, our, our number at 5,600 requests. And again, we attributed much of this to, to folks just working at home, being at home, um, and having the ability to get out and, and get their yard work done. Uh, we collected 653.40 uh, tons, and our chipper program is always looked at um, very highly by the residents. So it, it's a great program. Not many communities offer this type of service. And um, our goal of service is one to seven days. Typically, we're out there within two days and we're achieving that 98% success rate on that. I can't tell you, uh, this spring we were we were pushing that a bit, um, but we were able to reallocate staff in order to maintain our goal of service. Jay, what happened to chipper materials? So a lot of it goes to Kurtz Brothers, our different vendors, so we will, we will chip it all up, uh, pile it up in our yard, and they will actually come with their vehicles and load it up and take it to their plants for recycling, mulch. Um, so it's reutilized, which is a good thing. Yeah. 
So moving on to uh, diversion rates, uh, this slide highlights our diversion rates um, away from the landfill over the past three years. As you can see, we've continued to increase our rate and are currently operating at a, almost a 52% um, with a goal of 55%. Um, previously, the goal was 50%, so we were uh, meeting and exceeding the goal, but recently Swaco has moved this up to 55%. Um, but our trends, as you'll see on the next slide, I think we're looking really good. So I think uh, it, it's not a problem to make that stretch. And I think we will meet it um, here very soon. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to mention that our shred day is uh, this upcoming Saturday, um, April 10th from nine to noon over at our fleet center. So I know we, we mentioned that um, previously and it's in a lot of our publications right now. I just wanted to give that a plug while I was here. So this is a slide I mentioned. Um, this shows, shows our diversion rate over the past six years, and you can see our trend by the bar graph that we're really, really picking up some momentum here and, and heading in the right direction. So our six-year average is at just under 50%, but recently we've we've had a nice uptick. So I'm confident that that 55% mark uh, that's been adjusted by Swaco is well within our reach. So moving on to parks maintenance one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I put this slide together. I, I think Dana had asked me a question back in, in January and started working on this slide. And it's really <laughs> looking at the, the different types of work that the Parks Department um, is involved with. And when we got, got to looking into it, we're involved with over 53 different work types. So when, when people think about the Parks Department, we, we've been anything but a Parks Department, but a Parks Department. Um, obviously, you know, parks are near and dear to our hearts, and that's our primary goal here. But uh, our staff is in a little bit of everything. So I just wanted to really, really highlight that when I was when I was creating this slide. And then the, the other purpose of the slide um, when I when I when I made it was to look at how COVID was impacting us um, from 2019 to 2020. Um, we obviously knew that events. Um, took, a, took a huge hit and would certainly uh, show that in our, our staffing hours. And we knew that shelter house cleaning and, and possibly trash removal um, may be the other ones, but I, I know you all saw the same things that I did. I've never seen as many people out in our parks or using our bike paths, our green spaces. And that was wonderful to see. And that's, that's what we like to see. And, and that's why we're here for you all is, is so folks can use those amenities we have nice, clean, safe amenities for people to use. So I guess that was one positive impact that COVID had was the fact that so many people got to get out and enjoy our, our parks over the, over the spring and summer months. Um, but really, there was there was no uh, no no secretive story to tell here. Everything was pretty much face value of what we thought it would be. Um, so no surprises. But shelter house cleaning and and even trash went <laughs> down. So I'm sorry, Kathy. Did you have a question? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I always like to talk about our our um, bike path snow removal and what parks does on a on a snow basis. Um, I know that that has a lot of interest. Um, typically, we have a lot of a lot of questions over that. I know a couple of years ago we had a a public service uh, public service committee meeting over this subject itself. I believe it was in the summer. Um, so I just want to give you a brief update on, on where this this uh, group is with their metrics. So total total miles that the parks department is responsible for is up to 53.81 miles. Um, so we're up to 31 miles of bike path that's cleared at each snow event. Um, six miles of that is parking lot. The one one mile that you see that's private street miles that's actually Kaufman Park Drive. Um, and then, believe it or not, 14 miles of city sidewalk. And if you, if you think about that, that's that's quite a bit of sidewalk that our staff has to has to clear after each snow event. That can really become cumbersome and time consuming on staff. Um, you know, when you have repeated back to back snow events. So that number is really getting up there. Um, but we're still able to uh, able to keep up with it. it you know, it does. Tend to take us a little bit longer these days with the, with those miles growing, but we're still able to lead our our operations. Jay, how many miles of uh, 
how many miles of bike path do we have total? Right John, I think it's, space. yeah, I, I, Brandon may know better than I, but I'm going to say well over 140. I don't know if Brandon wants to pop in. I can't see him, but. Yeah, Jay, this some, is Bob. The whole system's about 144 miles. Okay. And then I think the actual path it's is is around 120, I believe. But when I say the whole system, that includes crossings and pedestrian um, connectors and things like that. And Jay, the can start, I oh, go ahead? Go, sorry, John. Finish up. It's fine. No, no. I'm just curious about the snow removal on the uh, bicycle paths and the sidewalks. I I take it that's like down at the urban core in some places because. I know out here in Mirfield, we get that request constantly to remove uh, snow off the bicycle paths, and we've done all kinds of studies. And every year for 30 years, we told them, "No, we're not going to do it." I'm sure you're doing that down there in downtown and other key areas. From looking at your map, but yeah, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to highlight that a bit here in the next slide or two. But yeah, you're correct. There, there is quite a bit in historic Dublin. Um, there is some down in the new Bridge Street. But a lot of it, we we really focused on the years over ingress and egress to Dublin City Schools, and obviously our one uh, Hilliard City School. And I know talking with Walter uh, this year, he he had mentioned that they you all have been receiving requests, um, you know, to do more and more with with the bike path clearing, and and it is a lot. Um, there's there's a lot that entails um, the equipment, obviously, that we use on our paths. Um, is, is not cheap by any means, but it, it's what's necessary if you're going to invest and, in, you know, have these paths and have the equipment and ability to, to open them up after each snow event. Yeah, we realized too that once we uh, remove the snow that we become liable in case they fall down in case we don't get back right away. So our, our interest is not removing the snow at all. You're, you're stuck, I understand it, because you've got a lot of pedestrian traffic in those areas and you're trying to trying to keep them open so two different uh, examples really certainly understand that yes yep jane i know you had a question no i want well, i think john answered i was just kind of curious where the sidewalk miles were so i think you pretty much answered that okay yeah and the, if you do go i know you're all familiar with our gis mapping um there is a layer and it, it's basically the screenshot that you're seeing but you can pull that up and you can really hone in and see specifically what areas are done and where they're done at. But basically any any city property that we own that has a sidewalk in front of it, we're required to clear. Bike paths by city code, we're not required to clear. But like I said, we, we take that upon ourselves to do those who that are deemed the ingress and egress to city city schools. Jay, I, there is one other quick question I wanted to sure, ask you sure. because of the bike pass, and I, I understand this. This is probably a futuristic thing, but is other than, you know, the way we plow these bike paths now, um, if we ever really wanted to make our city truly connected year round so that you could use the pass, you know, and they were always going to be clear, you know, obviously it would be how many more man hours how much more equipment how is there is there any way that we would ever be able to get to a point do you think that we could clear the bike paths year round all of them not with the staffing or equipment we have now um yeah we'd have to do a pretty pretty thorough study to see what would be needed um but given the equipment we have um and the the time it takes and depending you know each snow is different um it takes us you know obviously the smaller snows we're, we're through it a lot quicker um but i, I think you know ultimately we we kind of think that's that's probably the direction you know someday yeah you know, that's our goal is is to be able to have the ability to clear you know almost everything um but again it's it's what will that take and are we willing to you know, pay price to do that. Well, with climate change, who knows? Maybe Ohio won't have any snow. <laughs> I am all for that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so, so highlighting our, our park expenditures for for the snow and ice season for the 2021 um, exact same snow events, obviously the streets and utilities, um, and obviously quite a little less um, on the expenditure front with the parks uh, park staff. At 160, almost 168,000. 
So doing the quick math, if you find the two, we ended up just right around 978,000 um, for this year, um, assuming no more snow. Um, so um, kind of touching on what, what John had mentioned, Jane as well, um, regarding you know, what, what the city or the, the parks department is responsible for. It is all city building sidewalks and parking lots. Um, historic Dublin city owned property frontage and city parking lots within the district. Um, John Shields uh, Parkway, Riverside Drive, that's on the park side of, of Riverside Drive. Um, bike paths with ingress and egress, Dublin and Hilliard City Schools, as we talked about. Um, we do try to open bike paths and select parks for recreational usage. So um, Indian Run Meadows, Avery Park, Emerald Fields, we try to get to those areas after everything's done because um, we, we know folks want to get out and walk and jog and walk their dogs. So we try to open up when we can, what we can when we can, in addition to our normal um, operations. And then again, all city sidewalks that border city property. So just an important thing to note, and this, this is kind of similar to what we've shown on the, the streets uh, slide. So the, when you get into the significant snow events, um, and those tend to be six inches or more, um, it really magnifies the workload um, of staff and the ability to, to get through the bike path system and then the city sidewalks. And we will pull our staff back and focus on city buildings and obviously reallocate our staff um, to our primary responsibility, which is the, the streets and the roadways. Um, and then once we get caught up and we're in a good place, we'll, we'll release that staff back to the park system where they can continue on to their, their uh, shared use path clearing and sidewalk work. But there will be times obviously in these bigger snow events where it does take the park staff longer. And that's just because we're putting them on primaries and in roadways and it's not their fault. It's just allocation of resources. So with that, we'll move to horticulture. Um, so we are in Earth Month, as you know, and, and we have uh, several special activities all month long to celebrate this. Um, I always like to remind everybody that Earth Month or Earth Day for us is, is almost every day because um, that's kind of what we're in the business of doing. So we're always promoting and planning and, and looking to enhance our, our natural environment within the parks and open space. So, so this slide uh, briefly highlights what our horticulture staff planted last year by the ways of trees and shrubs and perennials. And we're, we're right now right around a, a 60% native rate. So we're always trying to be strive for, for, you know, to get as many native plants back into the environment as possible. So we'll continue to work on that mark. Our perennials, perennials can be, be everywhere. There's so many different varieties of perennials. Um, that, that number brings us a little bit down, but but we really do well on our native uh, trees and shrubs. Jay, how much of the uh, uh, plantings on the intersections in downtown do we sub out, and how much of that do we handle ourselves? Um, in the right of ways, right? Uh huh. And the traffic all, roundabouts and all that stuff. They're that's really one hundred percent contracted out. It is. We don't do yes. any of that. No, sir. Did we design it because it's really rather attractive? I mean, a lot of them are really really pretty cool you got to say that you're proud to be a dubliner when you go around the traffic circle yeah a uh, lot of that design so is by hey, hey, our, that. do we have do we have a budget on what that costs to sub that out i'm sure it's cheaper than probably using our own staff and our own staff's probably overworked so yeah yeah that, that's that's our right away maintenance contracts and yeah we have we have definitely have all that information i could certainly pass it along to you uh, another question that we had brought up, Jay, that's sort of now falls into your bailing wick, unfortunately, is in Dublin was laid out with the idea of screens, screening the backs of houses. So we'd have, have this beautiful sort of green corridors everywhere you went in Dublin. And uh, that was sort of a takeoff of maybe Washington State where you see uh, forests of firs and you're driving along, you know, what a lovely state. And you walk into the, the woods 100 yards and everything's clear cut on the other side of the 100 yard buffer of trees. <laughs> but we sort of use that to make our town green and pretty, that same concept. Uh, we have been talking about, and I don't know if it's got down to uh, actual, your working level, but we've been talking about analyzing. Uh, so you drive down Mirfield Drive, for instance, and you see the 
Norway spruces are now like 60 feet tall and 40 feet tall and 30 feet tall. And they went in when the subdivision went in. But we were talking about perhaps doing a study where we know replacement wise uh, that we have to replace these trees and uh, wish they were earth berms so we didn't have to replace any trees. But uh, we would replace these trees on a cyclical basis of maybe every 20 years or 30 years. So I don't know if uh, Dana or the staff has talked to you at all about working up a master plan, maybe with our landscape architects. So we know the cost and also know the time period when these trees are going to be no more uh, barriers. So you'll soon see through the backs of the trees and you'll see all the different colored houses and the swing sets and the uh, trampolines. And, you know, we're still trying to keep that real neat, uh, you know, it's greener in Dublin look. So I don't know, uh, Jay, you know, what your involvement is in that and what's going on and all that. And I would like, you know, just try to have a reference point and see if we're thinking ahead uh, on all these buffers because, you know, a lot of the earlier zonings, they they ran the, the lot lines almost to the sidewalks and it was hard to squeeze in a buffer. And then we got a little cleverer and started putting in 30, 40, 100 foot buffers uh, that allowed some plantings. And I suppose in the future, it'd be best if we just put in earth berms and decorated the hills with some crabs and, and trees and be a lot cheaper because we don't have to replace the trees on every subdivision that comes in. Uh, so I don't know, I'm just sort of curious where you guys are at or if there's any been discussion on this, because this is what keeps the city looking green and beautiful and not just a bunch of housings, houses with, you know, the backs facing streets. So. Yeah, I, I know, uh, I know Matt and uh, Sean Koreski and, and Michael have been working on, on a lot of what you, you've mentioned there. And, and I know there, there is much more work to do on that. Um, but yeah, it goes back to the, the easements along Murfield drive that we're working on securing and, and doing the plannings along there. Um, so, yeah, we do have staff that are looking into that and starting to take that voyage to, to see what we can do in the future to, to kind of hopefully avoid some of the some of the situations that we're in today. Yeah, you know, Jay, and when we're talking about every inch of Dublin, too, because, uh, you know, whether you're on uh, Mirfield North or Mirfield South or any of the other Wilcox Road, but any of the screening elements that, you know, were mandated by zonings to try to make these subdivisions look better. Uh, I think is what you know, I think what we're interested in seeing that that's kept up to a higher standard and level and that, you know, these trees are getting old and, you know, you know what's the replacement time? How much is it going to cost? When are we planning to replace all this stuff? And I think that's what we're really interested in knowing so we can keep that green, beautiful look for Dublin that sets it apart from every, almost every other city. Sure. Understand. Okay. Forward thinking. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so real quick to finish out uh, horticulture. Um, so we all know, obviously, diversity is important, not only in our work environment, but uh, as well as our natural environment. So we do make it a point to try to prove on our, our overall biodiversity. Um, within the park system. So we, we try to get as much diverse plant material as we can um, out there that, that makes sense um, throughout the park system. So this kind of shows the different species that, uh, that staff planted in 2020 with the growth to tree shrubs and, and perennials. So something we, we like to promote and we encourage homeowners when we talk to them and our residents as well um, to try to get some diversity in your landscaping as well. Jay, one quick question, and that is there's like 38 trees uh, and it's only 20. Well, that's 2020. Is that the average? Don't, I would have assumed we planted more trees than that in a course of a year, but of course it was the pandemic season. So maybe that affected it. Do we do more than that normally? Yeah, we did. Um, so the, the slide, the previous slide, we were at 317 trees overall, and that's, that's just horticulture. Um, so out oh, of that 317, we had 38 different species of trees planted. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's I got okay. You now. <laughs> That's okay. Right. No problem. Great. Thanks. No problem. So talking about trees, um, and last but not least, we'll wrap up with our our forestry work unit. Um, and so this is this is this year. So we're current on this slide, um, 2021. 
and uh, highlights from from forestry staff will be doing 246 street trees uh, this year. Those are a combination of new and replacement street trees. And then we do continue, if you see the little, little light, lighter blue area to the left there, we do continue to experiment uh, more with our bare root trees and we have had success. Um, so we're, we're continuing to experiment and plan a little bit more with those and see how they do here in the future. Um, and but our, our main tree, obviously, as as the normal stock is our BNB ball and ball and burlap trees. Um, and just to highlight uh, the the bare root um, real quick, um, there are some positives, and just like everything else, there are some negatives. So they they certainly are lighter. Um, so staffs easily able to handle more of those in a in a given day and get them in the ground. We can dig a smaller hole. Um, they are less expensive. They potentially do have better growth potential. Um, that's probably open for debate as with everything. Um, same thing with survivability and adaptability. Um, they, they can tend to survive a little bit better. Um, but with positives, obviously there's always negatives and um, some of the negatives are they're smaller. Um, you know, some homeowners can, you know, we've heard the, heard the term wimpy um they can that, that first year or two it takes them you know they do look a little bit smaller than that bnb tree um they can be harder to find um more watering initially a um, little bit more attention needed at planting we really got once we receive delivery of them we really got to move pretty quickly to get those guys in the ground before they dry out but um you know it, it requires faster turnaround times on planting as i mentioned so there's give and take on them but we've had we've had some success and and you know, from everything we're hearing, if if you compare that tree with the B and B tree in five years, you really there's not much difference that you can tell. And from what my forestry staff tells me, that that inevitably down you know long down the road, that this uh, this bare root tree should be a, a in better health. Again, there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot of factors at play, but um, they they seem to be very high on them right now, and they they are a little bit easier on staff. So. We're continuing to kind of go down that avenue a little bit. Yeah, that's a good uh, route to take because I donated a street tree planting to Columbus on East North Broadway, and just noticing that all the uh, bare root trees have outperformed the bald and burlap trees. But like you said, there's a very small window. You got to buy them early in the spring. You got to get them in. Schmitz is a good supplier. I don't know where you guys get yours out in the uh, West Coast, but. Uh, no, it's a good program. Uh, just so you're planting them with some really good topsoil, and the other key is staking them right. But I, you know, it's it's just a, it's it is a good program if you got a good crew that knows how to install them. And we do. We're we're fortunate in that fact. So, but yeah, you're right. You really got to move on them once you get them. Yep, it's a very limited window for the springtime to get them all in. Very much so. Yep. All right. Well, these last two are just our bragging slides. So um, this is our 30, 34th year Tree City USA. Um, we're in our seventh year of uh, growth award for Tree Cities, Tree City USA. Um, second year Tree Cities of the World, um, over 3,200 street trees. So uh, it, we've got a very proud forestry staff and, and with good reason why. Um, so they do a terrific job out there. I'm very proud of them. And then- What's uh, your What's I'm the requirement sorry. for street trees of the world? I, that's an interesting. That's a new one. Yeah, that's a new one, John. That that <laughs> I'm not completely 100 <laughs> percent up. It's very similar to to Tree City USA. Um, I think there's some there's a few different um, nuances that you have to meet. Um, similar to the growth award, where you're contributing more money, um, and then I, I think a lot of it has to do with what type of engagement you we do, and obviously we are very engaged with our residents when it comes to this program. So I think a lot of it more often than not has to do with the engagement, um, but it's it's just another another accolade that um, that you can acquire. So um, not you know, too many, so I think we were the second city in the, in the state um, that did, did, did achieve this, um, so. Yeah, it must be, I wonder if it's numerical or it's based on how many square miles we got in our city, and then that's related to how many trees. And I suppose, I don't know if your staff is aware of the study that came out of Denmark and Sweden, that if 
people would go out and plant trees. There would be no earth warming whatsoever. They calculated the number of trees that have to be planted. And it's an amazing, so you don't need any windmills and you don't need all this other junk. All you have to do is go out and plant some trees. And if people would spend money on a tree <laughs> instead of a dinner, uh, we could have a hell of a great world and we can get rid of all the earth warming cries and moans and groans and just clear that right off the slate of uh, problems, you know, in the world. So, and you know, when President Bush won came back from the first world conference, he said when he got off the plane and, you know, it's amazing that this hasn't been carried out in civilization was people asking, well, what can we do about this? And it was a new thing back then. And he said, just everybody get out and plant a tree for God's sake. So. <laughs> Uh, no, it's a really important aspect of civilization. It's a shame that, you know, we have to discuss earth warming when it doesn't even, even have to happen. So all this money wasted and all this discussion when all you have to do is buy a tree. It's sort of crazy, really. Yeah. So John, I, the, uh, I, I think uh, I read that and if I, if I remember correctly and you don't quote me, but I think if we look at Dublin at a population of 50,000, I think it it came out to 10 trees per person, and we in Dublin would meet that goal, but it'd be 10 per person. So over a 10-year period, if everybody in Dublin planted one tree a year, then we would meet the goal of the study. Cool. That was pretty doable. Yeah. Okay. That yeah. was good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Jay, very much. It was a question. Much. Questions? I had a question. Yeah. Jay, um, the, as I'm walking through and, and out and about the riversides and the edges of the park, lots of down trees, lots of cleaning that, in my opinion, needs to be done. I know there's a naturalness that has to be maintained for the lot for the, you know, for the um, animals and for Nate, whatever, but I know there's some cleaning that needs. What is our um, rotation? How, how do we manage that? Because it seems that some of the parks have been clean and others haven't been for some time. So could you share a little bit about, you know what I'm talking about along the riverways and on the edges sure. of the, the bike path and the, thank you. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's something we certainly want to do more of and, and we're, we're making that a priority moving forward. Um, but the thought behind it is to protect or preserve your best woodlots first and then work your way, you know, subsequently down to, to your less desirable or less quality woodlots um, or wooded areas. So we do try to focus on our, our, our higher quality woodlots and then as, as time permits, um, move on to other areas. But I really think we want to focus on on getting some contractual labor in there to assist us to get some of this cleaned up because you're right. Um, over time, you get too much of the good stuff down on the ground and you have to go in and clean some of that up. And um, and I think we're at the point that point with several of the, the woodlots and we've had discussion with with our city forester and city horticulturists on how we can get a program or plan together where we can some more focus and some more funding into getting these woodlots cleaned up and and we know that is something that that definitely needs to be done and certainly on our radar so jay I, i'm wondering if we could create one of the metrics here like you showed us some other metrics that <laughs> says this is how much we have this is where they are here's sort of our rotation i know we have rotations for street maintenance and repavings and all of that i, I think that would be great i mean some of it i it's many 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 years it hasn't been and others to your point have been so i wonder if there's just not a way to put that then we can begin to measure it to your point what does it cost et cetera, so forth but i just as most people been out and about a lot more this last year on the bike paths and stuff and i think we just need some some tlc there and i know it's a huge lift and i'm sure it's not inexpensive thank you no but that, that's a great idea and we'll certainly do that thank you Nothing, so. Hey, Jay, and the last thing is, uh, you know, we, we're trying to keep streets, um, certain streets with the same plant material and diversity is great. But when you are doing a street tree planting, and I'm sure I hope everybody's aware of this by now, because it's been brought up a number of occasions that uh, the single street contains one species of trees. And of course, then we switch to another species on the other 
street and uh he was there for a while and this was in columbus and other communities you know they wanted to plant one of this and one of that and one of this and one of that up and down and it added to the visual clutter and confusion of the, of the uh, community so it was bad enough that a you know a tudor house is next to a spanish house is next to a new england house and everybody in america wants to live in their own house which is great but there's you know uh unanimity of design that sort of ties the community together unless you have a common street tree so I know there was a lot of discussion on this, and I just hope that everybody's aware of that over in your department, that if we're going to do a street tree planting, we want the, the trees to all be the same species on that particular street, and then the next street over, they can switch them in case there's a disease that sweeps in and wipes them out or something. So I didn't, yes, I didn't sir. Know, yeah, if that was all loud and clear. And Yes, it okay. is. Yeah, okay, I appreciate you. that, though. Yeah. Yeah. I just had one more question yeah. along yeah. those same lines. Um, I live in a more established neighborhood mm -hmm. and our trees are all aging out and residents who don't have John's background. I'll put myself in that category. <laughs> sure. Um, most of most mere mortals, um, you know, what do we plant to your point, John? You know, and so what I'm seeing happening is the immediate streetscape looks one way. But we're seeing we're seeing diversity and a variety of things. When the housing developments were built, they were built with some pattern. And so I wonder as the spring comes, are there classes or programs where we could help residents say, here's the types of things we would suggest, here's the distance apart, here's, you know, is there a are there a series of classes? Maybe they would have to be virtual this year. But I really think residents would really appreciate some help. I mean, they'll they'll go to the nursery and say, I'm looking for this kind of tree or something, but to really look at the landscapes and the streetscapes, and I'm seeing that happen very much in the neighborhoods where I am. I don't know if you've had demands for that or what are your thoughts about that? We did that um, a couple of years ago, obviously pre-COVID, and our staff loves to get out and we would do it via an HOA. So we would go out and meet with a certain neighborhood typically in a park and we would we would send them a list of topics and have them choose what they wanted us to talk about and then that would dictate what kind of staff we sent out whether we sent out a forestry staff or horticulture and forestry staff or a park staff um, but yeah that's a great idea we, we we had good turnouts on some and some not so much um, but we could certainly put that our staff loves engagement and loves engaging with the residents so that's something we could toss back out there and see what kind of interest we got. And we're more than happy to do that. And and maybe some virtual ones too, right? Yep. Just some virtual yeah, that's what I was thinking. types of trees and here's here's where they work well and don't. And if you're if your ash trees are dying, here's some thoughts and you know, just that people could go back and refer to as well. I I just I think residents would love that, um, and it wouldn't necessarily require they have to come out on a Saturday morning or you know even whatever. I just wondered. Um, I think it would be really appreciated. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. We'll certainly look into that. Here's something that happened today. Today while I was out today, I got a call from a student at a, at Dublin, and I, I don't know how this will fit in with UJ or us City Council, but. Uh, the little young lady said she'd like to do a environmental advisory committee from uh, seventh grade to twelfth grade, and you know how does she arrange that, and who can she talk to, and uh, it's all about the environment. It was sort of interesting to hear young people that involved because I haven't seen a lot of that since the '60s and this particular thing. But uh, I just told her to come to city council and present it to you know the city council, and then it could be you know we could work with uh, you know community development or public services or somebody could work with them and listen to their suggestions. And maybe Jay, that's you. Maybe you listen to their suggestions. They come in and meet with you and uh, <clears throat> you can sort of ferret out which ideas are really, you know, value and which ones are not. And, you know, just try to keep them engaged. So it's sort of, it's sort of wonderful to see uh, young people coming back out this period and being that interested in the environment. So basically I left it with her and, Please come to city council and make a presentation for your five minutes and we'll take it from there. And I don't know what the rest of the city council thinks about that or UJ or uh, just something that happened today while I was out working, got a call from a student. So 
What yeah, I, I would agree. We're seeing an uptick as well on the on the calls we get from high school students, and and sometimes it's this time of year um, centered around a project they ha that they have to complete. But there's there does tend to be an uptick in in interest overall in the, in the overall natural environment. So that's that's something positive that I've noticed here in the last few years as well, trending upwards at least. Yeah, this is going to be a student advisory committee, and it's sort of interesting to listen to them and. You know, uh, many of these things that I've done with them and this kind of thing and Eagle Scouts, you don't want to let the yeah. air out of their tires. You want to try to encourage them and, you know, take them down the right path because they're idealistic and they don't know what really works and doesn't work in the real world. But uh, so we'll need some kind of mentoring to keep them on the, uh, keep them interested and yet uh, keep them coming up with ideas and uh, keep them involved. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. Sounds good. Well, listen, Jay, thank you. Anybody else have any, any other thoughts before we move on? Because we have quite a bit to have ahead of us. So um, quite informative and um, appreciate it, Jay, so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, thank Jay. You. Thank you. All right, I guess we better move on. We better get moving on to the 2035 framework plan. And um, we'll open this up. Here we go. Jamie, I guess who's a uh, Homer uh, or Logan? Who's opening this up? I think Jenny might be. Uh, Jenny? Oh, Jenny, I didn't pick your square. You didn't win the million dollars. <laughs> oh, darn. That's a bummer. Next, maybe next time. OK. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to give our introduction tonight and then, yeah, turn it over to Jamie and Logan to help us facilitate the second part of our of our discussion tonight. Um, so again, thanks for letting us come before you and, and kick off um, our more in-depth work related to 2035. And I have a short presentation here, which I will share with you all. Okay. Can everybody see my screen okay with the presentation? Hopefully, okay. So um, this evening, I wanted to talk through where we are with 2035, what that process is gonna look like how that fits in with the overall project and the milestones, so you can sort of see where we've been, where we are, where we're going, so everyone sort of sees that complete picture um, for this project. And then, oops, and then talk through what the purpose of tonight is, which we included in your packet, and hopefully had a time to look at that this week um, and, and have some initial thoughts. And I know that Kathy and Jane had the opportunity to already do this um, a little bit with the administrative committee. Um, and then, talk through just the work that the committee is going to do, and then we'll have our facilitated discussion. Um, and then as part of that, we'll talk through what happens after this. So I thought I would give us a grounding of 2035 and where we are now, um, and really wanted to talk about, you know, what the purpose of this is, why we're doing it, and how this helps inform us moving forward. So we have included in your packet a one pager, but this is just a really brief synopsis of what that what that included, which ultimately is looking at this unified framework, looking ahead to 2035 and looking at it from a very visionary perspective. So what are these big ideas? What are these unique things, efforts, um, undertakings that the city can do to position us and be and be forward looking? and strive for. So again, they're meant to be stretching us, stretching us to think of things we hadn't considered before um, that will really make Dublin continue to make its mark. Um, and why are we doing that? Because we have always done that. We have always looked forward, pushed ourselves um, to be the first to do various items and really wanting to be the best. And this is another step in helping us helping us define that more globally for the city. So how do we look at this from a big perspective? Um, and really looking at how this helps guide us so as we make policy decisions in the future, as we update the community plan, which would be the subsequent step after this, as well as CIP planning, um, as well as other community collaborative projects that we work on. So that's sort of the why, but also informs the how. So using this as our overarching plan as we move forward and guiding us. Um, and then obviously we would make updates to these various documents and policies that help align with the framework as it's defined and ultimately determined by council. So from that, we thought we would share a quick timeline, which again, we also included within your packet that shows um, the work session that we had in February, but we also had one prior to that and how all those pieces sort of help, help us 
inform this discussion as we move forward. So we've had the opportunity a couple of times to be before council and have those discussions with staff. And obviously this was an outcropping of your 2020 goals um, and, and really pushing us to have that forward thinking. So this helps us continue to put that in motion. Um, so we've identified in the center here, which are the three big milestones. And I think as we had outlined at the administrative committee, that doesn't necessarily mean meetings, um, it could, but we are at milestone number one right now. So really looking at identifying what those initial big ideas are. So nothing is too big um, at this point, and we're not really looking at how we're gonna make it happen and whether it will work. It's really just to get ideas out there and get the conversation started. And then the subsequent milestones two and three help us refine those and then put some parameters to how we could do this, what additional information we need, um, which that's part of our discussion tonight too. So wanting to initially to know, you know, what do you all need to know to move this forward that either staff can provide. We obviously will have some public engagement, as you can see within milestone two, as well as some expert engagement. So if there is um, topics or people or things that you would want staff or our consultants to look to, to bring to you, to bring to the community at large, to get input on and educate us. Um, that's also part of the conversation. So having some initial information tonight about that helps inform then milestone two, which is that further refinement and research and discussion. And then following that, then we would be at milestone three, which is sort of the completion of that refining, prioritizing how this is going to happen and what those you know, perspectives look like and how we're going to make this happen, which then ultimately re results in the adoption and acceptance of this by council. And then our um, great task of implementing this and making sure this happens. So we're at sort of that beginning phase of this um, and, and really looking forward to the conversation regarding that. So tonight we're going to um, have a facilitated discussion here in a second. I have two more quick slides just to get us thinking. Um, but our planning consultant team, so Jamie Green and Logan Stang from Planning Next are here again um, to help us talk through the big questions that we're going to talk about. Um, obviously, want to hear from committee members. And then we do have a number of division directors who will be participating um, and providing their thoughts as well. So that helps us have a nice dynamic discussion uh, and and sort of play off each other, similar to we did to the admin committee. So the discussion questions tonight that we're gonna talk about here in a minute are, what are your big ideas for your theme? So for the public services committee, your theme is infrastructure and um, wanting to understand what those ideas might be. And then, as I mentioned previously, what, what do you need to know to help justify those as we move forward? So within infrastructure, we had previously outlined items that were either from the community plan or that came up as part of our previous discussions with council um, and the elements that potentially fall with under infrastructure include parking, communication, mobility, transportation, utilities, connected Dublin, and smart city. So as we go through our exercise, we may have big goals that fit one under each of these. We may have some that overlap several. We honestly had some on Tuesday night that probably overlap in this in this group. So our, ultimately our goal is to get these ideas related to infrastructure, but they may relate to other ones. And we'll talk about what we're gonna do about that once that happens. But at this point, we really just wanna get your, get your input. And so the last part of this we included was this sort of big idea starter. And for infrastructure, that's the third group down um, below there we really started to do that. So here's the ideas we've heard so far and how they fit within your elements and then maybe also address other elements in other themed um, discussions. So the ones that have been highlighted so far um, are providing high-speed fiber to every home, construct, construct a mixed-use hyperloop station, ensure every resident has access to car-free transportation, connect all public spaces with internet access really looking at, again, those don't have to be the ones we ultimately come up with, but those that those are the ideas that have sort of trickled down or bubbled up, if you will, um, as part of our initial discussions. So that's just to sort of get your brain um, thinking. And I'll let Jamie talk through it a little further, but as we get into this, and we didn't have enough time to sort of prep everybody ahead of time, if there's 
images or ideas or things that you would want to share after the meeting. Uh, we can talk through how to do that if that helps articulate your point. Um, we had a lot of discussion on Tuesday about that that might help moving forward too. So we'll provide obviously an opportunity for that after the meeting if that's helpful. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and let Jamie fill in all the things I forgot to say um, and then lead you through the through the discussion part. Of this. No. Thanks, Jenny. You uh, you did an excellent job, and a couple more of these you'll have it really down pat. But uh, but before getting you know into it, I just as a as an outsider, I just want to say that um, we get the chance to see a lot of other cities and how they work and what they do. But Jay's presentation was really impressive. Uh, the amount of data, you know, the way it's organized, that you're able to actually collect the data and display the data. Uh, that was really, really cool to see. So I, uh, I appreciate being able to see that tonight. The, uh, so Jenny did, a, I think, a really nice job of giving you the kind of the background so that we can jump in here. Um, one thing I wanted to say to add to what she said is that it's natural. I mean, last night in the quality of life um, brainstorming, there were, you know, ideas that people came up with big ideas, but big ideas, you know, a lot of times have multiple tentacles on them. And so we know that they they lean or reach into some of the other the other areas. And what we intend to do, um, what we intend to do is to get through the first four meetings, the first meeting for all four groups, and then prepare an analysis document that sees, you know, wherever there's an idea, where does it fall? And is it falling in more than one of these? And there's a council work session in May at which we will bring that, you know, forward at that point. So we, you know, don't worry about where it falls tonight. But Jenny did provide you a series of those elements that, you know, as you're thinking through and brainstorming tonight, you may want to actually, you know, rely on those as a touchstone for some of these for some of these ideas. So I saw that uh, Homer asked for folks to turn their their cameras on. And I think that was a request last night as well that we're, we're going to be brainstorming and there's a sense that we could do better if we could since we can't be together, if we could at least see each other, that might that might help. So we have we have an hour uh, to do some brainstorming. So we want to get as many of these ideas out on the table. We can you know vet them at some point. Uh, but I'd like for you to find the sweet spot between like efficiently delivering them, but also giving really the essence and the flavor of the story behind a particular idea. We're going to build these out. You know. Uh, in more detail, this is being recorded, so we have the ability to go back and capture some of your words. But as um, as Jenny said, if you leave this meeting and you had an idea and you think it could be better conveyed if I shared a picture or a video or something, we want to attach that, you know, to the to the database of ideas. So keep that in mind as some additional homework. So I'm going to I just just uh, call on folks going around for those of you who participated last night. Uh, you can't recycle your ideas. You have to come up with some new stuff. So hopefully you held something back there for us. But uh, if we could, we could start. And uh, Jay, I'm going to go with you because you were you were on fire early. You must have some uh, big ideas. Maybe something that John inspired. But is there an idea that you might want to put out there? Big there's, idea. There's no rest for the weary around here, is there? That's right. <laughs> Um, mine was, and Jane touched on it Tuesday as well, but um, it was designated bike or pedestrian lane, or, or yeah, pedestrian lanes um, protected by, by curbing. Um, so I did a dual picture, so focused Excellent. around mobility. Um, but um, something along those lines, and again, I know Jane had, had touched on that, so I know that's not a super fresh exciting idea um but but that was that was one that i felt pretty strongly about and jay wh where is the geography that, that applies to is that to a particular type of corridor or wh how extensive are we talking about uh, well i was thinking all of our you know as many primary routes um on our primary roads as possible um okay. i know that's extremely expensive i know that's a humongous undertaking that's not realistic but Looking at our primary thoroughfares um, and, and trying to get folks at access um, throughout the city um, and then connector points from there on in. Okay, well, we, I just to be clear, like we're not 
we're not doing feasibility evaluations right now. This is the <laughs> dreaming of thinking good. big. Yeah, so don't be concerned. I say that looking at three council members. Don't be concerned about the money, Jay. Don't worry about that. Jenny just fell Jay. off her chair. <laughs> <laughs> John, how about you? I think you're muted, uh, John. John, you're muted. I want to say that my issues are more on the uh, environmental side. I, I think uh, you guys are doing a great job covering uh, what you're covering for uh, the future, but I'm st I'm still concerned about keeping up the uh, the uh, overall look of the city, which you know has been fought for in a heck of a lot of planning and zoning things. And I I guess what I'm still looking to see out of the uh, the staff is you know coming back with something about um, these greenways that we've been so meticulous and spent so much money on and like saying hey you know in 19 or in 2040 we need 40 40 uh norway spruces that do this area and and this year we need so many to do this area so that this town continues to be there's this there's this pattern of of uh plants that are re rotating in as we're cutting down the trees and our screening is disappearing and uh so I, I I'd like to see us plan really long term ahead to keep you know our, our slogan it's greener in Dublin alive. Right. So it doesn't you know it doesn't really fit with some of the items that we're really working on right now for uh, communication and all this other stuff. But I think it's really important to our town because people have always told me that when they drove to different cities and decided where they're going to live in Arlington or New Albany or Dublin, they chose Dublin because it's green and it's beautiful and it's well planned. And my interests are still in that particular genre of my specialty as a landscape architect. So yeah. that's what I want to see preserved. That's what I want to see thought out in the future. That's what I want to see planned out. And I want to see the money, you know, put aside for those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Because in a lot of the zoning battles, in the earlier ones, we just had very narrow corridors of green space hiding the unsightly aspects of the rears of homes. And now I think in the future, we can start using earth berms, which are a lot cheaper and you can just decorate the hill and they don't have to be replaced. And I think it's very important for planning and zoning to learn how to do that. So mm -hmm. that when they're planning a subdivision that they have a, a, a 50 or 70 or 100 foot setback, so you can put a mound on them. And, you know, yeah. these kind of things are what I'm interested in so that we progressively think of the future and and keep this green look and that's okay. that's primarily what i'm interested in okay great thanks john and and logan is keeping notes for all of us here that uh, we'll take a look at at the end to see how we've initially captured them but john what you what it sounds like what you're talking about is this this major greening initiative or you know regreening or but but it's really a very comprehensive notion about how the landscape is treated and maintained here in the city. Yeah, and it's and it's really important because uh, really, Jamie and I and I and I enjoyed working with you over the past years. By the way, you, you did a lot of good things for us. Thank <laughs> and you. You're, you're a good mentor. Um, yeah. But you know, it's it's just that you know, as you're starting to look around, you're seeing um, you're seeing the uh, landscape sort of dissolve and you're starting to see really unsightly aspects of our community that need to be propped back up and that's got to be done either through earth mounting with plantings or and we do have landscape architects on staff but we got to start thinking about this so that we always keep this um, venue that's made us sort of famous and made us a really pretty city yeah so no, that sounds good thanks john yeah. bob how about you All right, this idea is kind of in the, my bailiwick of <clears throat> asset management, but the idea is laser, LIDAR, video, drone scanning of all of our assets periodically throughout the city and then using artificial intelligence to predict and forecast um, the conditions and kind of head off problems before they become problems. Mm -hmm. So that with this artificial intelligence, they can start to see something disintegrating before it's actually disintegrating and, and we can do a lot of more of that work up front which mm -hmm. where it's a lot cheaper mm -hmm. than waiting for something to fail oh. well i can tell you bob I haven't heard that idea uh in this process yet so i appreciate you sharing that what i have heard though is like a real interest in 
developing technology and uh, demonstrating technology, and that certainly would uh, would go a long way toward toward doing that. I don't know if it's possible, but it probably will be in the future, especially with like LiDAR technology. Heck, there's LiDAR on your, your iPhone now. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's a, it's a terrific uh, thought. Um, Paul, good to see you. Hey, good to see you, Jamie. Good evening, everybody. Um, probably my idea is centers around mobility again, and I think we've possibly tried this, I think, uh, some years ago, but, you know, now that autonomous circulators are becoming something that's viable, mm. it's something I think that we ought to explore. Um, you know, we've got a very vibrant community, um, especially in Bridge Park, but it's, you know, you think of the number of workers that we bring in, if everybody ends up back in their offices, to be able to provide that circulation without having to get in your car. Um, sometimes during the day, a bike isn't necessarily feasible while you're at work. Um, but be able to take advantage of all the amenities within the community itself um, and, and move folks around and, and do so in somewhat of a mass transit mm -hmm. setting or format, but not necessarily a bus that holds, you know, 50 people, right. um, but maybe holds 10 or 12 mm -hmm. uh, that would circulate around the community. Yeah. Great. And I know Columbus has tried this with uh, what they've been looking at in transportation. Yeah. Well, good. Thank you. So, Matt, I know you were you were up last night. Do you have uh, something else? Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I'm going to piggyback on the whole connectivity um, everywhere we go kind of aspect. Where whether it's our private residences, all the businesses, and all the public spaces that people can access. I think that is the way of the future. Whether that's through um, internet, that's wired or on a wi-fi system or the future of satellites that kind of thing and be prepared for that i think the future of our workspaces are going to be outdoors i think the future of our, um, our meeting spaces are, are going to be individual versus um, clusters of people everywhere so that's that's one thing and then along those lines i think with the astronomical speed at which technology is advancing I mean, we saw some pretty amazing things happen within just one year um, during the pandemic that we didn't expect to happen for many years. We had it on our radar, but we didn't think about it. And I think it's plunged us forward, in, especially with the whole remote working and the um, autonomous vehicles conversation. What happens if and when we don't need all of this office space? What happens if we don't need all the parking spaces? I think we need to come up with at least an idea of what we might do with those parcels, with those with those assets. And you know, are they repurposed into recreational facilities? Because I'm selfish like that. Um, or you know, can they be back to John's point? Can they be? Um, reverted back to a very beautiful landscape of, you know, woodlots and things of that nature to help beautify the city. I just think these things are on my radar and I just don't know how far in advance those things might come about, but I think it's sooner than we think. Yeah, and that, there's, there's a big idea in there to uh, try to address that in the comprehensive way that you, um, you described it. Maria? Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll kind of piggyback off of Bob Taylor in terms of um, considering AI for predictive, but rather than maybe predictive with assets, I'm thinking predictive with um, our residents' needs. So maybe we know that they had utilized uh, chipper service this year. So we can kind of get back to them and say, hey, last year you used our chipper service. Are you are you ready to sign up now for chipper service? You know, for this year or something like this. This might be something our team has already thought through, to be honest. But I'm thinking um, about those kinds of things. Is how can we bring service in a different way? Um, maybe hey, you bought diff tickets last year. Here's here's some activities that are going on right now that your family may be interested in. Um, and I suppose you can get even deeper, but that makes makes you start thinking of things like. Uh, 
you know, like, hey, we know you have three kids and a dog, and we've got this great, um, <laughs> yeah, we've got this great craft thing going on where we've got uh, build a dog house with your family. To, you know, I don't know. Yeah. So I'm just trying yeah. to think of ways that we can predict what services mm -hmm. may be needed or predict maybe how we can um, provide those services in a different way. Well, that's a really interesting thought, Maria. So, uh, Jane, would you like to jump in here? Sure, I, I love this conversation. And um, so I have a couple of them and I don't know, Nick, if you got my slides or not, but um, if you did, um, I may have you show them in a minute. Um, I had the um, one of the things that we have come to understand, though, is council members have to have administrative approval to share, so I couldn't share, so I, I can't figure out how to get my slides on, so maybe Nick can. But on um, on the connectivity part and what Maria just said, I wish I could I show you, but I, I would point you to the city of Tel Aviv. They have what's called a city residence card, and every resident in the city has one, and it is using AI to connect every resident to everything that they need. And when you fill out the resident card, you're asked particular questions so that um, they understand that you have children in school. So you might need, uh, AI a, might be looking at how they can tell you when you should res register your child for kindergarten and they'll send you a reminder. Or what time the bus comes to pick up your child and they'll tell you where the route is. It is a all-inclusive card that will get you a city service, direct you to a to a department that will remind you to do something that's going on in the city, that will take a survey of your opinion, will be targeted to your neighborhood so that if, if there's a question about the neighborhood, only the neighborhood residents would be notified. It's called, it's out of Tel Aviv and it's called the city resident card. And I think that would be, there's Homer putting his hand up. He must yeah. know about it. Well, I just wanted to share with you that um, we have a new director of IT that's going to be starting on the 3rd of May. Okay. And he spent a lot of time in London working at one of the universities there. And what you're talking about is something they did that he has experience with. Great. Uh, that they did with the university there with the students. And they end up having these cards made that was their student ID, was the bank card. They got them access into the buildings. So it was really kind of a multifunctional, multi use card that brought in several different services for that community. So, yeah. along with your idea, we have somebody that has some experience with that that's going to be starting with us here real soon. That is really cool. Uh, yeah, Bob. Yeah, and that kind of dovetails into some of the things we've, we've already been talking about and looking at with blockchain. So, you know, to keep that all secure as well. So, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. It, cool. it, his name is Michael Ferrar, by the way. Okay, but that's great. That's exactly. I mean, there's so many. You know, we have so many programs that are like sort of uh, diverse, but putting it all together in a card and using AI to be able to target what individually you're interested in, not necessarily just flagging it out to the whole city. So, yeah. so that was one of them. But I, I want to. Um, this is about mobility, and we're all talking about it. I think because of the 33 uh, district and the autonomous um, vehicle work that we're all doing, I would like to see a high speed multimodal um, mobility terminal. And I don't know, Nick, to, do you think you can get any of those slides up? So I was able to extract two images from the from what you sent me and one's yeah. the UAM complete trip and the other was of a building. Oh shoot. Sorry. Okay. What well, can you just put let's see what you got. Okay. Uh, let's just see what it is. Okay. I will share it. Yeah, and not even the little vehicle, the little vertical vehicle, you couldn't get that one. It didn't come in. Okay. 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 Next. So here's one image. Okay. So if you can enlarge that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. The flying UAM. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. You see that little vertical, uh, that little, uh, it's, it's, it's like, um, this is t happening today. These little vehicles, NASA has a plan and actually 
One of these is, is in existence in Hilliard, Ohio right now. But what I'd like to see, if I could dream it, is out on the west side of the city uh, where the Hyperloop is planning on going, a high-speed terminal that would incorporate not only an Amtrak high-speed train, the Hyperloop, this, these flying vehicles will become, they say by 2028, Uber will be using them to fly people places. Autonomous vehicles that can be robo called and you can, uh, uh, as Matt said, or um, I think who brought up the idea about, yeah, I think Matt, where you can take an autonomous vehicle anywhere, a terminal station and maybe the building, which is the next slide, Nick, they're, um, they're building these in Europe now um, to accommodate a variety of mobile uh, high speed transportation. And this could be connected to that green, the pedestrian and bike uh, greenway from the west side of Dublin to connect to the rest of the city as well. So all of the major, if you can imagine to be able to say that in this city, you could come out to our mobile transportation center and you can go to Chicago, Cleveland, or you can take the last mile, which is what that little um, that little diagram was. Um, you would leave that station. You might take a scooter, an e-bike, another means of transportation, go into town, catch a robo uh, autonomous vehicle, and and make it to wherever you work, play, or want to have a, a bite to eat. And it's the complete trip. And I think with the um, the autonomous work that we're doing, it's just a natural place to have something like that. And I wish I could show you the other slides because they're amazing, but I'll work on it for the next time. Yeah, no, thanks, Jane. And um, we're going to call for at the end here. You can actually email stuff into, you know, the staff, and we'll put the, we'll put a composite together. So we, if you want to do that, that would be terrific. Kathy, do you have a, a big idea you'd like to share? Another big idea. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> piggyback on a couple of them. I, I think one of this is that we we need to think about what our definition of infrastructure is in the city. So mm -hmm. it, historically, it's been roads and bridges and things that or bike paths or whatever. But we've got to add some type of connectivity, whether that's fiber or what we just we have to think about that differently. So by you know, I, maybe that's too far away, but by 2025, we have an annual budget, we maintain it, we we know what that is. Mm -hmm. Under the um Biden's transportation plan, um, connectivity to the homes, I've read that preference will be for municipalities, um, the, the funding will go there. So we may have a window to begin to do that. But when we think about that, then one of the things that I think about is putting um, sensors in our streets and our pavement for traffic safety, for slowing, for, um, you know, right now the number one concern I hear from residents is traffic and speeding along our roadways, et cetera. There yeah. is the technology now that we could we could begin to and soon complete um, you know embedded connectivity in terms of I, I guess this was back to I guess Maria's point is that you know knowing what residents care about and being able to put that in the infrastructure. So I, I think we yeah. just need to redefine what we, what was in that bucket we call infrastructure because sure. right now we have a CIP that looks at, you know, a variety of things and we just need to think differently about, um, I think, you know, what that might look like. Back to the shared cards that you're talking about. One of the things that libraries, and I've had some experience with that in my life have done for, quite some time is, you know, um, making sure everybody has a library card if they can from the time they're little. Right. What I've seen happen during COVID is they're doing outreach for food, they're doing outreach for care, education, and a variety of things because they do have a card and they do have connectivity and they do have technical infrastructure. So I think that that the comments about having some type of a resident card. I don't know if it should be our card. I don't know if it should partner with somebody else's card. The last person 
people want is one other card. Um, they may <laughs> take another app, but they're not necessarily going to want another card. So what I, I know libraries and others have said is, you know, how do I partner with the most pervasive things there and just connect with it rather than trying to create my own and, and manage that. So, you know, we've seen that with um, AWS services and, you know, some cloud based stuff that you don't have to have your own. But that doesn't mean you can't integrate. So again, if you think about infrastructure saying, I want to be able to connect to roads, I want to be able to connect to homes. I want to be able to connect to whatever customer service platforms exist out there where I can share the services that I need for uh, for my community rather than trying to necessarily build your own, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, we haven't said it. I mean, yeah, carbon neutral by 2040, is an interesting or by some date um, mm -hmm. begin to if you're going to talk about sustainability and the environment we really need to we need to set, put a put a stake in the ground about when we're going to be carbon neutral and or something else i had mentioned the other night you know let's plan to have half of our cars electric by 2035 right so mm -hmm. just plan for those types of things in the infrastructure so those are just some thoughts. Thanks. Oh, those are good. Thanks, Kathy. Tammy, would you? Uh, I know you got shortchanged the other night, so I should have started with you. I apologize, but you have a, a, a big idea you want to share. I don't feel short shortchanged at all, Jamie. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And yes, of course, I have an idea. Um, <laughs> I, I I thought about the two things that I love most in life are planning and animals. And I don't know if you, I've done some research on if you've heard of um, wildlife uh, crossing bridges. Jay, where are you? I was gonna pick your brain about this. Um, not only are they beautiful and a great amenity to a community, but obviously they have a safety component for wildlife. Um, but they also, there's great numbers in terms of um, prevention of accidents that occur when, of course, uh, vehicular traffic is combined with wildlife. So I think it's a win-win. We get safety, we get something pretty, and, and animals get to survive. So that's my that's my contribution. Good. Good. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, Brandon, how about you? Sure, thank you. Um, I have I have one and a half, so I'm, I'm going to cheat. <laughs> So, so my my kind of half is is based on the conversation the other night about education and, and continued learning in, in this lab environment and where we grow. And I think it would be really cool to incorporate it, basically making it a lab, you know, so so as new things come out and, and it's kind of what we've been doing in Dublin for a long time, like trying to get in on the 33 corridor, trying to get in on air taxi testing and hyperloop stations and all those kind of things. But having kind of a living learning lab and, and places where we could do things like things that we wouldn't think of, like vertical farming, um, you know, to pay heritage to our heritage, um, where we may use up the land for the farming, but we could do it in a more efficient way. Um, so that's one side of my idea. And the other one is, is this goes back to someone that used to be in the service department long, long ago when I started Bill Grubaugh, and I had the idea that we should heat the streets and the bike paths so that we don't have to plow the snow. Which, which that idea led to the real idea, which is utilizing our infrastructure to generate energy, which goes back to one of the ones that we crisscrossed with quality of life of becoming energy independent or what Kathy just mentioned about being carbon neutral. We have a lot of infrastructure that we could be utilizing um, and, and even thinking in terms of commercial buildings, you know, I, I know there's sensitivity about solar panels and various things like that in residential areas, but some of these things will we'll have to face, um, you know, coming into the future. But I think there's technologies out there that they'll start in the next 10 or 15 years that it can become invisible and just part of the environment. So, you know, whether there's been testing with pavements that actually have um, solar cells built into them, wherever we have retaining walls or guardrails, wherever we have these different types of in infrastructure that, you know, Bob and his team want to virtually inspect and, and inspect with LIDAR, figuring out a way, how do we harvest energy from that? So those are my big ideas. Big indeed. Uh, Jenny? Well, this, I, didn't, I didn't even get to participate in the first one either, so I guess I need to get my ideas in for that after the fact. Um, yeah. I thought I was going to get a pass. No, um, no. 
<laughs> no, again, I think the mobility piece is a big, a big thing for us. And we were having actually some internal discussions the other day and um, discussing how to provide connectivity in, in our neighborhoods um, from a mobility perspective. Um, I was thinking the other night when we were talking about quality of life about public art installations within every, every neighborhood, but why not mobility as, as something, whether it's a hub or it's adjacent to several neighborhoods, how do we, how do we provide that on a bigger scale? Um, and again, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but that feels sort of like in line with what Paul was saying and maybe even where Matt was going of how do we provide these connections on a more grander scale for all of our residents. Jenny, I would let, let you have another idea since you've okay. been not treated well, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Yeah, all right. So, uh, you know, we went around everybody this time. So what I would like to do now is just to see if, you know, who, who has something that maybe they didn't get to share the first time or something has come to them that they, they want to um, put out for us to, uh, to think about, so I'll just you can you can physically raise your hand. You can raise your hand in in the software, John. Yeah, I'd like to see a, a continuation. I think most of us who've traveled a lot in Europe love the walkable cities, and we're really happy with the Bridge Street corridor, mm -hmm. and would like to see it expand. And uh, I, I, you know, we had plans for that to happen at OCLC, but then the management changed another entire city from the ground up with shops and places for people to live. And there was a third place we were looking at too. So in the future, I think, and just because, you know, they work better, the, the uh, traffic's better, everything's better if you can walk, um, you know, the whole sense of community, the savings on uh, utilities and everything else. So I'd like to see us keep working down that venue, working with these different places we have available mm -hmm. in Dublin that we might develop this whole concept all over again. Cause I think we, I think we did a good job with the first one that we got and, mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out to be a, maybe a, a, you know, a big plus for the city and maybe even a savior for the city tax wise and uh, changed our whole entire city around and put it back on the map. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you know this, Jamie, but the people that came in and seven, eight years ago that we first met with came back and said, you know, we use Dublin now as a model for the United States of America. So this is a big planning firm out of New York and another one out of New Jersey. And they said, when we're in San Francisco, San Diego, New York City, Dublin is the city that did the walkable city correctly. Other yeah. ones had too much residential, not enough this, not enough that. But they said Dublin is the one we now use as a model. So, you know, we've been successful with this. And I think we ought to look into the future uh of continuing this idea and keep continue planning this kind of thing yeah no it definitely john is a model in the you know most of our work is outside of ohio and we we regularly hear when people know we're from central ohio dublin comes up especially you know bridge bridge park and we brought developers in here to meet with crawford hoying just see what you've done and uh it is really impressive but a lot of the community is impressive homer i uh passed over you in the first rounds so i'm gonna go back there well, actually, I was going to uh, complain about Brandon because he stole my idea. I'm sitting there going, nobody <laughs> thought about this, and yeah. he, he got it right there at the end. You know, but yeah. yeah, it was about the, you know, being self, you know, sustainable as as a city um, mm -hmm. in terms of energy. You know, we look at we're going to need elect, you know, there's going to be electric cars, General Motors. Somebody brought up the other day this plan mm -hmm. on you know, being electric by 2040 and, right. you know, there's going to be a need to generate power. And, right. you know, I just think that, you know, as we're looking at building standards going forward, how we, you know, are engineering our, our roads and pathways, you know, bikeways, whatever, if we have opportunities to put in those, I mean, I've seen pavers, you know, instead of using brick pavers, they have pavers that have, are actually, you know, um, you know, solar panels in and of themselves. So this, the, the walkway you're walking on can generate, you know, power, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I think that um, and in incorporating it into our buildings, into the structure somehow, I don't, I don't know how to make it look good or not. But, um, you know, some of that incorporated in there are just imaginative ways of how we can go about generating, you know, energy and power so we can be more self-sustainable. That was my question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Homer. But thanks, Brandon. As yeah, thanks. Man. Yeah. <laughs> as we as we continue on here in our remaining time, I would 
ask you to look at the starter list and see if there's you know anything on there that you know some of them you've already addressed um, but if there's anything there that triggers an idea and also look at the elements to see if there's anything that we haven't you know that you think we should address the other thing i would throw out there for you is you know we're you're talking about 2035 and you know planning out there and i i wonder when you think about these big ideas you know if you're thinking about you know, young people in the workforce, you know, in an intentional way. I mean, a lot of what you're going to create is there's another generation here that uh, would be attracted to it. So I think it'd just be important as we work at these to make, you know, to be thinking about the generation that's actually going to be uh, enjoying or benefiting from, you know, the big ideas that you're um, putting out there. Okay, so, so anybody else have another thought, a new thought, or want to react to anything they've heard? Yeah, Jane. Yeah, you know, I, I think as we've, and I sat in uh, yesterday and, and now, I'm hearing really two very strong trends, connectivity and mm -hmm. mobility. And mm -hmm. as you just mentioned, Jamie, as uh, it is for, sort of for the, the future, I think what the pandemic did to our youth is made them realize how important social connections were. And I think we've come to understand that humans can't live without social connections. And one of the things that's been hard as the as the world has gone into a more contemporary, fast-paced lifestyle is that we've been disconnected from each other. And I think if we can create um, the ability to move people to the places that they want to go, mm -hmm. and then make sure that the places they go have strong social connectivity. Mm -hmm. either on the way or at their destination, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have created a lifestyle within mm -hmm. the city that, that is really resilient and strong. And mm -hmm. so we can deal with the mobility, but then as John said, Europe, Europe has done it so well in that through all the ages, they've been able to have places that create great social connectivity. And as we design for our greenways or our mobility or even as john said you know new urban spaces um european plaza kind of philosophy is really important creating gathering spaces where people actually feel that they have some ownership of the public realm i i think it's all about a mass to me it's about a master design as you look at a city how do you create the movement and then the social connectivity when you either go there or you get there. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it seems a little abstract, I guess, maybe, but I, I'd be interested to hear what other people have to say about um, what real connection looks like, you mm -hmm. know, ideally in the big idea framework. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jane, I, I think, think right on. I think people want to be around other people. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, the age of this technology has isolated everybody. and. I don't care whether you're in San Miguel de Andy in Mexico and you're in the in this downtown area across from the cathedral and the public parks, I think. And as you said, Europe's figured this out. And I think people want to be around other people. And I think that's the crux of all this. So connectivity, whatnot, you want to be where other people are and where there's things to do. And I think one reason we like Europe so much and everybody runs off there is not really just the history but the fact that you can get out and it's nighttime and you're walking down the streets of Zurich or Hamburg or Stuttgart or where in the hell you're at, and you're enjoying other people and you're window shopping and some of the shops are still open and you can buy gelato and there's this whole sense of quality of life, which is punctuated by the fact that above these shops is living quarters and uh, these people don't have to go that far. And you, know, you see it in, in, in all over Italy, everywhere really. And the Americans have been really crappy at putting this thing together because they ran to their cars and they kept expanding out and out and out, and plowing out all their farm fields and really building these massive um, uh, suburbs. So it's time, I think, that we, you know, we're rethinking all this. And I think people here in this country are finally rediscovering this and hats off to the Bridge Street Corridor and your work, Jamie, and everybody else and putting that kind of thing back on the map. And I. You're absolutely right, Jane. So that's my take on it. Thanks. Any other reactions to, to Jane's? You know, I I think one of the things that not um, 
in our generation, and I'm looking around the window, I don't know who here is under 30. So, I, I, you know, one of the things that I see with my kids and others is these things coexist very nicely, the technology and the people. It's, it's not that they're, they're upset that they're tech that they have technical connection. They would not give up their phone. They would not because they're talking to people they haven't seen for they're staying connected with people around the country and around the world. They are more connected. They have a greater friend network because of this than most. So I think your wisdom, Jamie, about making sure we really listen hard to what they feel this new future should look like. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think they're very comfortable being connected. I don't think they feel, I think COVID made people feel socially isolated. That I believe. Yeah. I'm not sure the technology did. I think yeah. the technology has been liberating to many of them. They do videos, they're creative, they're, <laughs> you know, so I, I think we, we better, we better actively seek out <laughs> minus 30 because I don't know that we can adequately reflect that real because we have not lived it. Um, okay. Even with our children, we're not living their life, right? So they're right. professional. So I, I think yeah. your your wisdom, your point there is a is a really important one because um, I'm not sure we know. Yeah. So but I think that Kathy, I appreciate that. I I believe that signals to you know, to the staff uh, that when we do those the public engagement, you know, that we've got to be really intentional about that demographic and we want it to be inclusive and representative but we have you know we're gonna have to, and that's usually a group that's hard to get into a, into a process like this but we can do it but um we'll make that a point but i think jamie if we use technology in different ways like send them an image and say what do you like about this or what i mean yeah, i yeah. think we have to be different than ask them to come to a the rec center and sit around a table i, I think <laughs> right. i think that's fine i'm, I'm not saying yeah. we should not do yeah. those yeah. things but I think we should we should use our own conversation we just had here and find how to engage with them in different ways because they'll they'll engage, but right. they just won't maybe right. necessarily do it like we've traditionally done. Right. And I think we should find a few of them that actually can help us figure out, you know, what the right technique is. You know, we we should not be sitting around figuring out what they what they would use. But if we could get a small group that actually could advise us and we typically get you know they're, they're, we can find them to do that but we'll use them to help us calibrate the right uh, approach were there other ideas or other comments jamie i just have one other and i don't know if jenny if this is the place to share it or not but it, kathy was talking about technology and younger people and that um that little video that i sent you jenny of that european technology company that that brought um that brought people together. I don't know if that's something you can share as an image of, um, and I can't remember the name of that company. Um, there is a company that uses, and we have we have people here, and Brandon, you may have seen something like this before. I know Roto does some really amazing things, but they use digital technology to interact with people to either create um, art, um, interactive socialization within a city. Um, they use it to enhance um, maybe features within the city to highlight our, uh, buildings in the city. And they also use it, but they've used it here in the, which I think Jenny's gonna pull up. They've used it to kind of create a digital experience within a, a park space or a natural environment. And and I only I was going to bring this up at quality of life, but it's it's really kind of infrastructure, um, just something to get your brain going. Um, I think it's uh, the Lumina. Well, I don't know. You can look. You can use any of them, uh, Jen. The video. So I turned the sound off, but we'll give you yeah. an idea of what it looks like. Yeah, they utilize uh, digital technology to create experiences within your city. And Matt, you, I was going to show this to you because this is a night walk through um, a, a park. Jane, this is amazing. Yeah, 
they're actually, this is in, uh, they have one in British Columbia. They have one at somewhere in, uh, I want to say in, in North Dakota, there is one. Um, and I think there's one in Michigan. Yeah, Jane, I know that our events team has been looking at this type of technology to perhaps replace the fireworks that we use and use the yeah. light shows instead. It's a whole lot environmentally cleaner and safer. Yeah, it's amazing. And if you get on and, and Jenny might be able to tell you the name of the, I can't remember the name of the organization, but they they utilize technology even in um, uh so many different ways that I had never imagined possible, but it's an infra, it's a kind of an, a technology infrastructure that creates a real experience. And that was just one of the ideas. And it, I don't know where it fits, but it's just an amazing kind of a, of a thing. It's called the moment factory, the moment factory. Yeah. Momentfactory.com. Okay. Yeah. You know, along with those ideas, Jane, I don't know if you guys have seen the one, I think it was Rouen in France, where downtown at night at 10 o'clock, they do something like this on a facade of the building, the building. entire history of the community, uh, just really super done, four stories up in the air, it's a light show, they make the um, front of the cathedral look like snakes are crawling out of the windows, buildings on fire, they take you through the whole history, and it's this giant community thing where everybody gets together and even people on ships get off the ships and go up into the the um, center city there to watch us. And all the young people come out and it lasts about an hour, hour and a half, and it runs every night. And it's just an awesome production. And there's some really good companies. I, I, did, I was checking into this in Europe. But that's what they specialize in. I'm sure we have the same thing in America or New York or someplace. But what a neat thing. The community to shut down at 10 o'clock, not shut down, but everybody to gather in gathering space and throw this these uh, picture graphs and this history and all this onto the wall of a building. It's just really a neat community thing, and it is well attended every night. So that'd be a cool thing to look to in the future. Yeah, that's great. So we have like 20 minutes left here, and um, it feels no one's like ooh 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 and me about uh, getting another idea. Oh, Bryn. Sorry, I, yeah, me wrong. it goes back a couple um, <clears throat> when thinking about what Kathy mentioned about redefining infrastructure. I, I think part of that conversation needs to go back and look at 1 of those guiding principles that we're using as draft guiding principles and that was um, people. People centered people 1st, I can't remember exactly how we phrased it. But thinking in terms of scale and what is the scale that we're building for and for those experiences. And I think as we're talking about what makes it approachable and, and great in Europe or in, in big cities. And just a quick story from a trip to Boston. I, I remember I was in one place downtown Boston. I was going to go to another place. I was like, oh, I'll ride the train. And, and then I started walking because I saw something. The next thing I knew I was at the next train stop. The next thing I knew I was at the next train stop. The next thing I knew I was at my destination. So instead of going underground and riding there, I was in an engaging, properly scaled environment that I was being activated. And, and suburbs don't do that. Dublin doesn't do that. It's, you know, because what we designed for, we designed for the scale of cars and the scale of speed that those were traveling at. So I think it's important that we consider scale. It's not a big idea, but it, it, but it is, you know, for, for how things are constructed. And when we think of how speedy certain things can happen, Hyperloop and some of these transportation, what you want to do is have this transition space and then have a space where things can be slow or where people can notice things because then they feel more connected. Great. Thanks, Brandy. I wanted to mention something what Brandon said, you know, when you talk about scale, that's a difficult thing. I think as, as we planners deal with it and planning and zoning, there's a technology out there that, um, that is some sort of a light laser thing that actually does a touch point on a building and tells you whether or not it's the right scale and whether or not the way a pedestrian sees it is attractive or unattractive or brings you forward or causes you to be away from it. Technology can create a streetscape for us that we can be guaranteed would be inviting. And I don't know how it's done, but the technology is actually out there. Yeah. That's good. You guys are definitely on the technology uh, topic here. Those are really terrific ideas. Uh, so again, we're at 15 minutes now, and 
I wanted to do a couple of things. Um, first of all, this does not have to be the end of the brainstorming. If you have some other ideas in the next week, you know, please send those into the into um, Jenny with as much description as you can. If there's imagery that goes along with it, whether it's a photo or a video like like Jane had shared, we want to capture the spirit and not just the words. We're going to work with the staff and try to you know put together a complete compilation of uh, all four committees' work, uh, what it looks like, and then again, as I said in the beginning. We want to make sure we want to see how these things are relating to the different uh, the different uh, themes, uh, and then we'll reconcile those with council uh, in in uh, in May, and then at some point we want to we want to go out to the to the public and 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 at some point you know we're going to have to narrow down. I mean you know there's a terrific amount of ideas tonight, a terrific amount of ideas on Tuesday. You know what's the capacity to manage? You know how many big ideas, and that you know, like how do we work on that? So that is just a natural part of the process we'll get to. But I would like to show you before we close out um, if Logan could pull up the notes uh, that he took. And again, we're going to go back and fill these in from the video, but just the theme so that you have these for tonight. So how many in total were there, uh, Logan? I see nine showing, but. Uh, there's about 20 hmm. that were shared. That's all? That's all. We had, oh, we had, okay. Just just so 20 I, big ideas. Yeah. So you can, you can I won't, I'm not gonna read all 20 of them to you, but you can see, you know, the, I think as Jane was saying a minute ago, the connectivity piece is really important. The technology, you know, is important. And again, these are these are the headlines. We we will put some more, you know, meat on them. And you can give us your there'll be an opportunity for you to give us comments if we missed, you know, the you know the essence of one of the ideas, but help us uh, better uh, build them out. Any reactions to these as you're as you're scanning them? Can you be sure you send us these like um, either via email or attached to a file of some sort so that we can, as we kind of think about and go on to the other committee meetings, we kind of have them to refer to. Sure, Jane, can we give them to you just kind of raw like they are now? I mean, we're going to do some sure. more work on them. But, yeah, but yeah. yeah, it's just something to kind of keep your brain kind of sparking. Sure, sure. Yeah, we can do that for both nights. And, and I will make the same request I made. The other night is that we visualize them. Right. And that could be drawings of uh, what it could look like with green way from one to the end and connected. Because I I think it loses as I read these, it loses most everything when it's just on a sentence. But yeah. if you can begin yeah. to create that, so I will continue to make that request and yeah. I, because yeah. I think the the big yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, is 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 not appreciate yeah. if you're not part of the discussion, and it's yeah. we, won't, we won't be part of some some of them. Other yeah. people will. Anyway, I will put that same plug in. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, well, Kathy, I'm, we we're completely aligned on that, and I think we've made the appeal for photos or videos or something about five times tonight. So, but if we can't, if folks don't have them, we will work to get that to populate this stuff and see if that's what you know what you had in mind. But we. You know, the, the whole you know, be, expression. Yeah, the expression just to be clear, about a picture tells a thousand. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm not I'm thinking about just populating pictures on a page, but rather, and I think Christina brought it up, is really creating uh, visuals and drawings, and then you could show, but I mean, it's not just to populate pictures that are not integrated. So you would have, you would have Dublin. Here is Dublin. And here's how yeah. we would envision yeah. these things in our community, not necessarily. So that's my plug. Uh, just to yeah. be clear, I want to be sure I was clear on what I was. It's not yeah. a matter of just integrating visuals with the words in my yeah. mind. So okay, well, okay. well, I appreciate that. We're this will be a this will be a process, right? I think, and um, I, I understand how important it is to you, and I, I agree. I may not completely understand yet, but I I agree with the idea of conveying it in more than words, and. Um, when I was thinking about like examples, I was thinking about like, you know, what Jane had just shared from the moment 
group or whatever, like if that helps somebody tell their story of what they mean, that's great. And at some point, we I think what you're suggesting is we may have to show what that show what that actually uh, looks like. Maybe it was was uh, Jay who showed a had a sketch that showed a, spe a specific you know a bike improvement, right? Like if that is going to happen on a series of streets, if that's a big idea, then maybe we could work with Jay to say, here's what it looks like in detail, but this is what it means, you know, if if that's what you're talking about, Kathy. It isn't. I'll try to find some imagery of what I'm talking about and send you okay. away. Um, okay. And then one of the images that I think is really neat, when Doug McCullough did an update on his technology, he had a lead-in slide that showed Dublin with different points on the map. I don't know if you guys remember. I had not seen that image before. I thought it was quite an interesting mm -hmm. image. So we could go back and look at that. But I, I'm... I will try to find a few examples of what I I was envisioning about, um, and and maybe it's not the right answer, but I yeah. do think it helps people see how they all work together, um, yeah, yeah. in an interesting way. So, right. you know, that you know, sounds Jamie, good. Uh, Jamie, another interesting idea is this, and uh, this is from a life experience out here, and that is, you know, planning. Uh, Mirfield, for instance, is planned around cul-de-sacs. And people all got to know each other. And then those little green spaces out in front of all the houses end up being barbecue areas and and party things for July 4th and Memorial Day and Labor Day. And you know, I I think to inculcate people into really good planning how this all works and how there's a sense of community. For instance, a friend of mine who's a physician moved to New Albany and said, you know, I hate that place. I don't know anybody. <laughs> I had to pay $100,000 to join the country club to meet a neighbor. You know, how important is a sense of community on a micro scale? So yeah. when you're doing planning in Columbia or in Dublin, that you look at that developer who's doing a lineal street and you say, you know what? Totally unacceptable. You yeah. break this thing apart, you put this in pods, you create right. a sense of community for that neighborhood, or you get the hell out of here. And I mean, <laughs> you know, that's, that's really, if you want to have a city where people are communicating and being with each other, you have to instill that into the fabric of the planning and the, and the zoning staff to figure all this out. Because having lived out here for 40 years, this thing works perfect. Every street has a, a green space on it. Everybody utilizes it. The kids play on it. It's really clever. So there's some really good uh, examples. And, you know, all of this was worked out by three or four landscape architecture firms that Jack Nicholas was smart enough to hire because he wasn't. And they came up with these ideas. And, uh, you know, and traveling around as a landscape architect, and I do every community in this, in this greater central Ohio, you got to say that Dublin has the best planning going for it and has the best sense of community in a lot of its communities. So, uh, so it'd be neat to sort of see uh, this kind of thing or people become aware of this on a micro level with maybe seven or 10 or 12 houses on a street, you know? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, Jane. Maybe we could ask uh, in the, with future committees to, uh, to include a picture with their big idea. And that way it might be um it might be easier for you not to have to go out and look for them. And also yeah. an opportunity for us to get a, a visual idea at the time of the meeting. Uh, yeah. I think that would be helpful. Okay. All right. Thanks. Well Jane, I think we're 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 finished with our work. I just want to leave you a few minutes here at the end if there was other business you needed to take care of. But thank you all very much this evening. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Well, thank you, Jamie. I really appreciate that too. And uh, we don't have, as far as I know, any other things on the agenda for this evening. So I would just encourage you to um, assemble some pictures, send it in. And then um, IT wise, I'd like to figure out a way that for at least council members to be able to be able to share some uh, slides or images um, and get that access. So Nick, maybe you can help with that. Other than that, anything else? Anybody have any? Any thoughts or questions or comments at the end? Well, it was great to hear from all of the staff, especially because I know that, and I said this last night, 
uh, council will not have the big ideas that are going to work. The staff will end up having the big ideas because you have been here long enough to see which big ideas need to be incorporated and what the future holds. So thank you for your input. Don't hesitate to ever bring it up and bring more of them forward. So have a good evening and we are adjourned. Thank you.